to sing together in worship with a lot of voices. There's just something so beautiful about that. So it's always good to be in fellowship, and uh, I'm grateful for all of you. This morning, we're going to be continuing through this teaching on the parables. Uh, we will be through up right through before Easter. And we're in Matthew chapter 13 still. This is going to be verses 44 through 46. Uh, the last couple of weeks, we went through a lot of scripture. And this week, we're going through three verses. Uh, so you might think, great, it's going to be a 10-minute sermon. Anyway, <laughs> we're just going word by word today. So no, <laughs> just kidding. But Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46 is, is actually two separate parables um, combined together. Now, we're not sure scholars aren't positive if Jesus taught them in one sitting back to back exactly, or if they were just parables he taught at separate times. And Matthew, when he was writing his letter, thought, I'm going to put these two together because they have a lot in common and it makes sense. Regardless of, of whether they were taught in one sitting or back to back, or if Matthew combined them, they teach something about the kingdom of God. And that's what we've been trying to understand as we've gone through the parables starting a couple of weeks back, that these were stories Jesus told using commonly understood examples from what people would have understood and seen around them and from everyday life, stories that he told using everyday life visual aids to let the listeners know about God's kingdom, to let them know that the kingdom of God had come and what the kingdom of God was like. For the nation of Israel, they were excited. They were looking forward to this idea of the kingdom of God. When God came and dwelt with his nation, Israel, when all oppressors were overthrown, when they entered this eternal reign of peace, they were looking forward to that. Jesus is letting them know it's actually come in a way you didn't expect, and it's come through me. This is what he's doing. He's letting the listeners know it came a little early. It came a little different than you expected. The big one is still to come, but right now there's something that's come in advance. That's what he's letting them know. That's what these stories teach. But every single story that he tells, they give this tidbit, they let the listener know the kingdom has come, and then they give the listener an opportunity to respond. That's what any good story, especially those moral stories that we've been told, to give you an opportunity to respond. So Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46, a few short verses. I got them on the screen for you, or I'll be reading them from the NIV. It says this, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and he sold all he had and he bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and he sold everything he had and he bought it. Would you pray with me this morning, God, as we uh, reflect on these verses this morning and as we retell the story that Jesus told um, thousands of years ago, God, may we first off understand the context and what was going on, what Jesus was trying to communicate. May we be able to visualize what was going on in that time. And also, God, more importantly, may our hearts be tuned into your love for us, God. May our hearts be tuned into the work that you're doing right now today in our lives and in the lives around us. God, may we have eyes that see and ears that hear. God, we lay before you all of our pride, all of our selfishness, all of our expectations. God, as a speaker, I lay before you everything that I want to communicate today, and I just ask that it be your Holy Spirit. And God, as all of us are listeners as well, we want to lay whatever our expectations are at your feet, God, and we want your spirit to be teaching us through this time. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So Jesus talks about treasure. And I don't know about you, but treasure was a little bit a part of my childhood. Not real treasure, of course. But the search for treasure. Right? I mean, it doesn't take much. You give a, a young kid a shovel. And you take them to the beach, and all of a sudden, treasure is found, right? And it's a rusty old pop cap, right? But, it's, but the, the, the itch begins, oh, I found something. I didn't know there was a bounty of wonderful things hidden in these beaches. 
And then they dig. It's like, oh, a cigarette butt. And the kid's like, no, 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 not you know. The parents like, no, not that one. They're like, oh, and look, someone's leftover food. And you're like, no, leave that one too, right? I mean, there's something about going to the beach and looking through the sand and finding treasure. And as we get older, we just find different ways to look for treasure, right? Because we realize that the beach is it's just hard to find good treasure there. There were, were not pirates on Lake Michigan, unfortunately. But instead, we look for treasure at yard sales, right? at resale stores, at Facebook Marketplace. We go antiquing. We watch shows about finding treasure, right? And these are a few Antiques Roadshow, right? Any fans? I mean, that was like a childhood staple, Antiques Roadshow. I don't know why. We were unique kids, but we really liked that show. Uh, storage Wars, right? Like, What are they going to find in this storage unit junk but anyway once in a while or american pickers right i mean there's something about these shows we just get wrapped up into it because that is something in our hearts and in our lives in our culture that's like man you might find a treasure you might find something of real value it might be hidden the seller might not know exactly what they have I may have just set out today just looking for something and I found what my heart truly desired and now I can go put it on my shelf and forget I had it. This morning we're going to be looking at the this idea of seeking treasure and seeking something of value because it's not unique to us. This was something that the time of Jesus everyone was excited about as well. And what Jesus does is he uses this desire to find something of real worth and value. And he tells a story and he lets the listeners know, hey, that's the kingdom of God. That's what God is here to let you know, that what has true value is here right now today. And he gives them an opportunity to respond to it. That's my prayer for us today, allowing faith to be at work in our hearts as we engage with the word of God. And this promise, this statement that Jesus makes that what God has to offer is the greatest treasure. He starts out by letting the listeners know, hey, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and he bought that field. Now in that time, in that setting, it was not uncommon for people to hide valuables, hide treasures in the field. There was not a bank. Uh, people might have lived in tents or very uh, loose structured homes. They didn't have the same sort of ADT security that we might have now. And so it was not uncommon if someone had something of valuable, of, of great value to go hide it. Maybe it was an inheritance. Well, I'm going to go hide this because my neighbor will come and take it. It was not uncommon to, to, to get something that was of value that belonged to you and to just put it away where no one could find it and you didn't use it either. Maybe for a rainy day, maybe for the future, maybe for your kids. And so because that was a reality, people understood that sometimes you came across treasure because if someone buried treasure and they passed away and no one knew where it was, anybody's opportunity to have. There's actually was a scroll found at Qumran, which is this, uh, this cave where a lot of ancient texts were found that helped us kind of put together the Bible and know what all was going on. And at Qumran, there was a copper scroll. Instantly that like, okay, it was made out of copper. And that copper scroll had on it listed where a lot of valuable things were hidden, like under this rock, in this cave. In this hole, like people had written down where their treasures were on a copper scroll. So this idea, this hope, this perspective was that it didn't, of course, happen all the time to everybody. But once in a while, somebody came across a hidden treasure when they bought a field. And when that person found it, it was like winning the lottery. Now, I've got to know, does anyone here have like a, a, a really great find in their story of you were antiquing, you were reselling, you were yard selling, and you came across a real treasure? And it's an opportunity. If you want to share it, you can. D did you have a treasure, Christian? What's, what's yours? Nice. 
And those are at your house right now? Okay. No, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Just, just, you know, just for like, perspective. Perspective. Uh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> it won't be when you get home. But anyway. Um, <laughs> But when we come across something of value, of worth, there's a response that happens in us, right? And it is joy. And it's anticipation. It's excitement. We're surprised. We set out today, not sure what we'd find and what did we stumble upon. Jesus says that there are individuals alive at that time who are walking around life and they come across a treasure in a field. Now, here's the thing. This story is not about ethics and morality. It's not about the fact that the guy found the treasure, he should tell the owner and go let the owner know the treasure's there. This is not why Jesus is telling this story, right? So don't get distracted by that. Don't be like, well, this guy's a jerk. Why didn't he tell the owner? Like, don't get distracted by that. Jesus is telling a made-up story about someone who found treasure, okay? And this individual, when they found this treasure, what's the response? He hides, hides, it, hides it again, and then in his joy, he goes out, he sells all that he has to buy that field. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like finding a hidden treasure, that there are a people, you and I, uh, and those at Jesus' time who are alive, who were just going through life. They were just doing what they do, and then in a moment, they're faced with something of incredible value, and that thing of incredible value, that treasure, Jesus says, is the kingdom of heaven. It's this good news. It's this work of God in the world. Jesus is letting his listeners know that in the midst of their lives, in the midst of what they are navigating, God has planted, has hidden to be discovered, has provided something of incredible worth and value for them. And if you know something of incredible worth and value is hidden somewhere, you go look for it. And if you know exactly where it is, you just go take it, right? Sorry, Christian. <laughs> Jesus wants the listeners to know that that stirring, that desire in their hearts to find something of great value is something that should point them and direct them back to the heart of God. He says the kingdom is already here. You've been looking forward to that treasure. You've been wanting God to come back, to overthrow Rome, to remove the oppressors. Guess what? It came early, and it is something that you can experience today, this joy of true value. See, he paints a picture of someone who stumbles upon joy. And I can't help but think of the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. In John chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, this is a, a real interaction that happened between Jesus and a, this individual. It says, a Samaritan woman says to him, Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. In this moment, Jesus is the one who goes and seeks out this individual, right? We, we might be familiar with the story. She has had a past. She has gone through husbands. She lives in a, a village where everyone knows her story. She has to go gather water in the middle of the day when no one else is around because she is so ashamed and because she cannot be around the rest of the women in her city. And she's living with a man she's not married to. And Jesus goes and he finds her. She's just going to get well water for her family, for her home. That's why she's there. And Jesus goes and he lets her know, hey, you know what? I've got a treasure and it's for you. I have got a gift that's for you. A gift you didn't know was provided through me. You might have, I had this idea, have had this hope of joy like this, of satisfaction like this. You might have hoped for something like this, but I bet by now in your life, you've said, you know what? I've looked for enough treasure. I'm not going to find it. There's no treasure for me. I've looked and I've looked and I've looked. And I've thought I found it here and I thought I found it there. I thought I found it there and it's just 
not been there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up on treasure seeking. What does Jesus do in this moment? He goes, finds her. He's like, I, tell you I brought you the treasure. I brought you this gift. Jesus is painting a picture of someone who just stumbles upon the good news, who just stumbled upon God, who didn't know what they were looking for, and now is faced with this reality, this goodness of who God is. And he tells this story to say, look, don't miss the treasure. Let that joy happen. And then do what is necessary to get that treasure. The story of the man finds it. And he willingly sells what he has to go buy the land so he can own the treasure. Jesus is letting us know that this gift, this good news, that the kingdom of heaven, this treasure that God offers people is worth all of the cost that it might take on your behalf and my behalf to acquire. And that when we see it, we experience great joy. We see its value. We see that it's worth the cost. And then we do what was necessary to acquire it. He continues the story in this way. That's the treasure story. Someone who stumbles upon the kingdom of heaven. Someone who didn't know that this is exactly what they needed. God provides it. Here's the, the story of the merchant seeking pearls. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and he sold everything he had and he bought it. Now, the story is very similar to the treasure-seeking story, right? Someone finds something of great value. But the difference here is in the person. The first story is someone who just stumbles upon a hidden treasure, didn't know that they needed God in their lives, found him, did everything they could to have him. This individual is someone who is out actively looking for fine pearls, someone who deals in these values, valuables. Now, a pearl at that time was considered to be like the greatest valued jewel. I don't know if it's technically a jewel. I don't know the difference, but that's what I'm going to call it today. So anyway, a pearl was held to be the most valuable item someone could have. Now, the thing about value is that most of the time it's pretty subjective, meaning people make up whether something's valuable or not. I mean, that's that's how it goes. If you really break down everything, and I mean, if, you, if you're going to be terrified of the economy and stuff, don't do it. Um, but the only reason that the paper has value, the green paper has value, is because someone said, well, it's worth this much gold. And he said, okay, sounds good. That's why it's got value. I mean, the only reason your paycheck has value is because somebody a while ago said, well, uh, this is how much your work is worth. And if you use what you have to go buy things, you'll get things. That's the only reason there's value to it. It could be anything. But value has to do most often with supply and demand as well. If there's a lot of something. In my childhood, um, in like I said, we, we were antique Ers, antiquers. We watched Antique Roadshow with my grandparents. We'd go to these just treasure trove antique stores in Mount Pleasant. I don't think we ever found anything, but we knew that's where they were. And there were two. And we'd go there. We'd spend hours and we'd look through the store. We'd look for books and we'd look for, you know, this, this treasure that the professionals didn't know was a treasure and that we could like get it from them. Like, oh yeah, they, they don't really know what a treasure is. Let's go find, yeah, it says 50 cents here, but it's really got to be worth 50 they, dollars. They don't know. These antique store dealers don't know the treasure. We do, 12-year-old. But anyway, and it was always a McDonald's toy. And you're like, oh, awesome. Look what I found. And yeah, that was a McDonald's toy. Anyway, uh, but one of the things that we got wrapped up in, at least me, was Beanie Babies, right? Like acquiring Beanie Babies. I liked the stuffed animals. I'm fine. I'm okay to admit it. Uh, I liked stuffed animals, and I held on to them way too long. Um, they're not. I don't have them now. I mean, I do have them. They're just not in my bed with me. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> They're at my mom and dad's house, but Beanie Babies. So there was not only did my my little sister and I we liked them, but we went out of our way to acquire them because we knew, and my grandma and grandpa were kind of involved. As they said, someday these are going to be worth a lot of money. 
So get Beanie Babies. Invest in Beanie Babies. This is how you're going to pay for college and your house and your dream vehicle, Beanie Babies. And I was like, okay, sounds good. I don't know much about money, but I know I like these things and they're $7 so I can get them. And so what did we do? We acquired Beanie Babies and I've got a big tote of them. And I think I have to pay someone to take them. Like, I mean, they have zero value. Why? Because everyone else was saying, we think Beanie Babies are going to cost a lot. So we're going to acquire Beanie Babies. We're going to have loads and loads and loads of them so we can be rich, which means the value is down to nothing because there's a million of them. Value has to do with rarity and supply and demand. And who's trying to collect this item? Because something valuable to you is worthless to me. Something valuable to me is worthless to you. If you're a Beanie Baby or a fishing out, I got a lot. Let's, let's make a deal happen. I can sell you some Beanie Babies. But what we understand as value is that it's subjective more often than not. It depends on what people think is important. What people are willing to give to have something, how much something exists. And so when we talk about value in our perspective, that's more often than not how we approach it. And so when God says, I have the thing that is of the greatest value, what you and I do is, well, let, like, let's run some numbers. Like, how valuable? Like, I know, God, you say it's really valuable, but like, my car has got a lot of value. And so, God, like, how much of my car are you worth? Or, you, God, you say you have what's the most value, what's most important. And, well, my time is very valuable. I'm very busy, or I have a lot of responsibility, or I have a lot of things I got to take care of. So, God, what's, what's the balance here? Or, well, I really like my caffeine, God. So, you say you're a value, but my coffee is really important to me. Some people, not me. But anyway, um, my coffee is really important to me. So, God, like, how much coffee are you worth? Or, or my sleep, how much sleeplessness are you worth, God? That's what we do every time. God says, I matter the most. I am the most valuable entity. I am what brings you the most satisfaction. I have the best value for you. We always look at it in that way. Yeah, but how much would you get on Antiques Roadshow? Is Tiffany involved in this, whoever Tiffany is? This individual who was out seeking pearls would have been like that. He had dedicated his life to finding the best pearls. He was a dealer. He sold and bought them. Traveled around collecting an expert in pearls. Jesus tells the story, this man comes across the greatest pearl of all time. There is none that can match it. It is the best. It is the most valuable, the most perfect. He comes across it. He's a shrewd judge. He's dedicated his life to finding and acquiring good pearls. And so he sees one and he knows this is worth everything. I don't know how you grocery shop, uh, but there's a... a an expensive coffee that they sell at Meyer. I really like it, but I don't buy it because it's $17 for like 12 ounces. But every week I just go and I look and I think about what it might be to have one. You know how that goes, right? I have simple tastes, $17 taste, but I have simple taste. And so I just go and I look like, man, I wonder what it would be like to drink that coffee every day. Oh, must be nice, right? And you just go through. And then every once in a while, I walk down that aisle and it's like fire sale. No one in New Ago County is buying $17 coffee. This stuff needs to go five bucks. And you're like, I'm like, you know, ah, I'm ripping them off. And they're like, no, it's old and they can't sell it. But whatever, I feel good. For this merchant, for this individual who knows pearls, who knows this craft well, he comes across one that is not on sale. It is the greatest of all time. He's not schemed anyone. He's come across it. Here it is. And what does he do? He goes and he sells everything to acquire it. We'll see that in just a second. But it reminds me of this story that Jesus was interacting with 
with a man named Nicodemus. It says, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night, said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God. No one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with them. And Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. That story, that dialogue continues. Jesus going back and forth with this guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is like the pearl merchant. He's a man who grew up going to the synagogue, memorizing scripture. He's a Pharisee, meaning he had dedicated his life to knowing everything about God, to knowing all the promises, to memorizing the Psalms, to faithfully serving. He knew it all. Nicodemus is like that pearl merchant. And what Jesus is saying in this conversation with Nicodemus is, look, you have found it. You have found God in me. You have found the kingdom. Nicodemus, you know what it's going to take? You've got to be born again. Everything you've dedicated your life to, all of this building up and acquiring all of the good works you thought you were doing that was making you favorable in God's eyes, all of that is nothing. The kingdom is here now. It requires a great cost, Nicodemus, and that might cost you your your um the way people look at you. That might cost you your job as a Pharisee, Nicodemus. That might cost you your high standing. And look, it came about in a way you didn't expect. It's going to require total renewal in your heart, Nicodemus. The story that Jesus tells with the kingdom of heaven and this pearl merchant is hopeful. Because what happens is this individual is willing to sacrifice all of the other riches he has. He realizes in order to get this one greatest of all time pearl, I've got to get rid of everything else. This is how costly it is. There's no bargain here. This is going to require all the best that I have. I've got to sell it. I've got to part ways with it so that I can go pay the full price, the full cost of what this one pearl is worth. In each of these stories, Jesus paints the picture of someone who comes across the kingdom of heaven, comes across the good news of the gospel for you and I today, comes across this idea that there is a God who's at work in the world today and loves you and wants to draw you into a relationship with you. And in order to do that, there's a cost. This is the lesson that Jesus is teaching. He's letting his people know the kingdom is here now. The opportunity to respond is now. Maybe you weren't looking for it. Maybe it just blinded you. You had no clue. Maybe your story is, is that like the, the woman at the well. For some of Jesus' listeners, their story was going to be like Nicodemus. They've been looking all their lives. But the teaching is the same. is that it both requires a response of acknowledging this is the most valuable thing my life could pursue, and I'm going to do what it takes to follow. That's what he's teaching in those two parables. And so as we summarize them, it's this. Is that the kingdom of God is available to everybody. That's available to everybody. That's what Jesus wants the listeners to know. And that ties to you and I today as well. That Jesus interacted with those who were just stumbling upon him, who just happened to be in the crowd that day and they heard his message. And he interacted with those who've been looking their whole lives and now are faced with, is this the one? Either way, God knows those journeys. He knows them intimately. And he is at work preparing the way for those individuals to face and find and hear and deal with that treasure. See, this idea of the kingdom of God was deeply important to the nation of Israel. Really, in a simple way, it's this. It's God's people in God's place under God's blessing. That's really what it was all about. God's people being where they're supposed to be, experiencing just the full blessings of God. I mean, that is what they were hoping for and longing for. And in that reality is where we find our truest meaning, where we experience and know true peace and joy and love and mercy. When we are one of God's people, 
when we are in his place and we are under his blessing, there is no greater place to be. Jesus is letting his listeners know that can happen today. That is available for anyone. Whether you're looking for it intentionally or whether you just stumbled upon it, it is available for you. You can have that. And so here's where the faith comes in. That the kingdom of God is of inestimable value. The nature of God is that he takes whatever systems and values and plans we have, and he says, scrap all that. Follow mine. Like, this is where it starts. It begins with me. The nature of God is that he says, you have your system of values, and yeah, you think that's important, but guess what's number one? Me. I'm number one. And it's not because God is some overwhelming, demanding, like, heartless individual. The reason he says, I have to be number one is because you and I were created for him to be that place in our lives. Because he is the only one who can truly provide the satisfaction for our souls that they long for. He is the only one who can provide the sort of peace and identity that comes that we seek He is the one who can actually satisfy those deep needs that you and I have, that deep need to be accepted and to have meaning. That comes from him. And he's proven his value time and time again. Although he has not had to, he still proves it. And he will prove it in any season of life. That's what the scriptures show us time and time again. We also know that God's goodness, his value is shown in its limitlessness. That at any circumstance, in any place, he's looking to provide this moment of being under his blessing, under his care. And that it's established. It never fades. It never lessens. It doesn't come and go as seasons change. That's why God's kingdom is the most valuable amongst just a few reasons. And so what Jesus wants his listeners to know is this. Here it is. Here's the opportunity. And you are called to understand that it's worth all you have. Whatever it is you have, it's worth giving that up in order to have this oneness, this kingdom experience with God. This is the the promise of Israel, right? We're going to draw it to us in just a minute, but this is everything that he's saying you can have because you might see this and you say, okay, it's like an exchange. It's like a purchase. I give God something, he gives me something. And that's not what Jesus is trying to communicate here. In order to experience this relationship with God, the people were going to need faith. Here's that continued conversation with Nicodemus. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. And then he says this one, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We're familiar with that verse. What Jesus is getting at with these parables and these conversations is that it always has to do with faith. It always has to say, okay, I see it, I hear it, and now I have an opportunity to respond to it. Is what God says truly what's best for my life? Is accepting this new direction in my life, is is welcoming Christ as this Messiah that he said, truly what was going to be best for the nation of Israel that time. That's what they had to ask. Jesus finishes his story, of course, by letting them know that the kingdom of God, what God offers to his people, leads to their greatest joy. When Jesus has total authority over every aspect of our lives, that's when we experience true joy. And that doesn't sound like it makes sense in our hearts. Because I like to control how I experience joy. I like to plan it out. And you probably do too. Well, I know what I like, and I like what I like. 
And if I have what I like, I'm happy. And if, and if I have worked in a way that I feel like I deserve what I like, then I really deserve what I like. I mean, just think about the ways we justify a candy bar. Well, I woke up today, so, you know. Well, I, I, I walked into the gas station to pay, so I deserve a candy bar, right? But the kingdom of God offers this different perspective for the nation of Israel, where Jesus says, when I have total authority over every aspect of your life, you feel and experience and know true joy. Brian Zand says this, the kingdom of God is an alternative arrangement of human society around Jesus, which leads to human flourishing. Jesus is letting the listeners know, look, you had expectations, you had plans. And let me tell you right now that if you align all of your lives around me, you will begin to experience and know the goodness that you hope for, the blessings of God, the work of him in your life. That's what this parable is for. It's an invitation for the listeners, for the nation of Israel saying, come and experience what I, Jesus the Messiah, have to offer you. And so you and I, we say, okay, that was for them. And we know that there's connections. We know that there's a, a, a direct correlation to our lives. And so what does that look like? It starts with this. Well, finished paragraph. Uh, anyway, it's supposed to be on that last screen. Sorry. Our invitation. That's why. Um, sometimes you forget what you do and then you get at place and then you find out what you did. So anyway, um, but our invitation is this, is that. God the Father has extended to every person in the entirety of the history of the world an opportunity to be a part of a radical new way of life. Through grace by faith, through acknowledging that Jesus is alone the one who can supply all of the needs that our hearts desire that we cannot experience and know and acquire the goodness of God on our own efforts. We can't experience that relationship. We can't experience his full blessing. We can't know him intimately, which leads to our greatest joy. We cannot experience that a part of the work of Christ in your life or in my life. And that idea of, of, of placing our faith in Christ is not only saying, look, I believe that Christ, you lived a sinless life and you died on the cross and you paid for my sins and I can be totally forgiven. Not only believing that and having faith in that, but also understanding that after that moment becomes an opportunity, becomes a calling to daily abide abandon our former way of life, to daily lay at the feet of God our selfishness, to daily lay at the feet of God our pride, to say, God, continue to rework my heart and my mind because I know I'm saved, but man, my heart and my mind sometimes don't make it look like I am, or my actions don't always show that I even acknowledge that you're a treasure in my life, God. You and I have the opportunity to experience and know the true value of of God through faith in Christ, and then allowing him to have a total reign over our lives. And so, of course, that question, that challenge, is what value does Jesus hold in our lives? Where is he on the list? Now, we can walk away feeling pretty crummy about where he probably is on the list. But you know what? It doesn't surprise Jesus. It's not blowing him away that we were, you know, he was number 17 on David's list today. That doesn't surprise him. Instead, what the opportunity is, is that God continues to pour his grace over my life and over your life and say, you know what? I'm about renewal. I'm about new life. I'm about abandoning the old. I'm about forgiveness and grace and mercy. And I'm about moving forward. And so, you know what? Yeah, I started out number 17, but now now's an opportunity to move me up number one. Lay all number the 16 before at my feet. Let me be number one. Let me minister to your heart. Let me draw you into the goodness of a life following me. Let me truly be Lord and Savior over your life. I had a conversation this week with a, 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 an individual who is just going through the ringer, who is going through some real darkness and some real difficulty, unfairly, unjustly, 
not because of choices they made. And as it goes with these conversations sometimes, is that this individual is a faithful follower of Jesus. In the moment, this individual is communicating to me they were experiencing joy. Grief, for sure. Heartache, for sure. Big questions, for sure. Total uncertainty, 100%. And joy. And that, I believe, is one of the truest representations of the value of God's kingdom for your life and for mine and for those who are, who are outside of the life of Christ is the presence of joy. Where Christ is our treasure, where we woke up in the morning and we started digging in the sand and what have we found? We found the greatest treasure of all. Or we wake up in the morning and we pull out that greatest pearl and we say, look what I was given. Look what I have the opportunity to own. What joy can ex be experienced in our hearts and what joy we can celebrate together. When Jesus is our treasure, when Jesus is our joy, it's apparent. And so the question is this, how is he calling you and I to respond? That was always the challenge, eyes to see and ears to hear. And that goes back to you and I. All right. So how are we going to be responding with this treasure we've been given, we've been talking about? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the goodness of who you are. Thank you that you truly are of greatest value. And God, you know our hearts. You know what we truly think is most important. God, you know the ways in which our self gets in the way every single day. God, every moment, you know our insecurities and our, our, our pride and our, our, our guilt and our shame. God, you know all of that that we carry with us. You know, God, the amount of times we've looked and we've searched. God, you know some of us have given up looking and searching. God, I thank you that the faithful presentation, the act of you giving yourself to us isn't determinant upon how we looked or how hard we looked or where we looked. It's just about accepting. So, Father, birth in our hearts, stir us up, God. Those places where we need you to be a higher value in our lives, God. Not because it's just what we're supposed to do, but because we realize and understand the true treasure, the true gift that you are to us. And God, may that be evident in our lives May that be evident in this church. May that be evident in this neighborhood that Jesus Christ is the greatest treasure any individual can own. May that be how we are known. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and close in our final song this morning?